rather busy with Lebanon. If I had an interest in that, then I would have been in Salt Lake City as an area. My problem is. Good evening, everyone. I'm Hiram Chodosh, and welcome to the 24th annual Jefferson B. Fordham debate. Jefferson Fordham was one of the 20th century's outstanding leaders in legal education. A prolific author and dedicated servant to the public interest, he joined the University of Utah College of Law as a professor in 1972 and in 1974 became a distinguished university professor after serving as dean at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Professor Fordham was a champion of individual rights and racial equality as he combined keen intelligence with integrity, a fierce commitment to justice with kindness and elegance. Chief Judge Charles Clark once said that Professor Fordham was composed of a core of Vermont granite enclosed in a covering of Southern charm. Chief Justice Earl Warren called Professor Fordham one of the more courageous, forward-looking, and effective forces for justice in our day. With the generosity of Professor Fordham's family, friends, and the college's journals, the College of Law established the debate in 1985 to engage audiences in legal topics of great importance, including most recently the war on terror, health care, climate change, and many other controversies. Since his sad passing in 1994, Professor Fordham's widow, Rita, has carried his legacy with grace, wit, and engaged inspiration. Rita, would you just stand for a moment to be recognized? In keeping with the tradition of the Fordham debate, our topic tonight is of profound importance and our cast of participants superb. Our debate tonight concerns the proper approach to regulating consumer lending with consumer spending such a large part of our economy and the recent financial crisis bearing a strong relationship to mortgage lending practices, this is a very important issue for us to consider. And we have three distinguished participants to guide the way. Our moderator, judge, and professor Ralph Maybe, the finest bankruptcy jurist in the country, professor Chris Peterson, who is the leading consumer law expert of his generation. And since he recently decided to join us from the University of Florida, I think we could all safely refer to him as the urban mire of consumer law. <laughs> and last but not least, Attorney General Mark Shirtleff, one of the country's finest attorneys general and one of our school's most distinguished graduates. It is rare that public figures have the courage to submit to the debate format, especially with a reconstructed leg. So thank you, Attorney General, for joining us tonight. Well, I can hardly wait. So I now turn the program over to Judge Maybe, who will introduce the debate and its format. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you, Dean Chodish. We also extend our uh, welcome to you we are happy to be here to stage this debate. The, this year's Fordham debate is the logical extension of the subprime mortgage lending crisis that is before us because it deals with and asks us to look at the subprime consumer lending circumstances. The proposition is be it resolved, consumer loans carrying interest fees that amount to annual percentage rates over 36%, such as those often made by credit card companies and payday lenders, shall be prohibited. Assigned to the negative of this proposition is our honored guest, Mark L. Shirtliff, who is Utah's Attorney General. 
General Shirtliff was reelected in 2004 with a 70% majority vote. He is an alumnus of the S.J. Quinney College of Law. His legal career has been one of public service, having served in the Navy Judge Advocate General Corps as a Dep Deputy County Attorney for Salt Lake City and as an Assistant Attorney General. He is the immediate past chair of the Conference of Western Attorneys General and has served on the Executive Committee for the National Association of Attorneys General. In addition, he serves on the Board of Directors of the America-Israel Friendship League, the Utah Prosecution Council, and the Commission on Criminal and Juvenile Justice. General Shirtliff's public spirit is not confined to legal matters. He is an honorary chair of the Utah Mentor Network, personally mentors elementary school students, in, 19, in 2006 received the Humanitarian of the Year Award from the National Conference of Community and Justice, and also recently received from the President of the, state, uh, the Nation of Mexico the Order of the Aztec Eagle, which is the highest award given by Mexico to a non-Mexican. We welcome you, General Shirley. <laughs> We're equally honored to welcome Professor Christopher L. Peterson, who undertakes the affirmative of our proposition. Professor Peterson is an associate professor of law at the University of Florida, a visiting professor here, and as Dean Chodish has mentioned, has accepted a full-time appointment at the law school here beginning in the next academic year. He is a graduate of the S.J. Quinney College of Law and served as an editor of the Utah Law Review and as a member of the Order of the Coif. Professor Peterson's most recent book is entitled Taming the Sharks Towards a Cure for the High Cost Credit Market. He has written and spoken widely on issues of predatory lending and has testified before the U.S. Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs respecting predatory lending practices. He's also advised the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation on such matters. You may be aware that recent federal legislation restricts predatory lending practices with respect to members of the military and their dependents. Certainly, uh, this legislation may in part be attributed to the work of Professor Peterson. Professor Peterson's public spirit is also reflected by his past work as a consumer attorney for the United States Public Interest Research Group. We welcome Professor Peterson as well. <clears throat> the debate will proceed as follows. Each of our debaters will first make a 10-minute introduction uh, of the topic, beginning first with Professor Peterson, who takes the affirmative of the proposition. He will be followed, of course, by General Shirtliff. After that time, we will raise the screen and take our positions at the bench. This is in part in deference to the fact that uh, General Shirtliff, we can hardly ask him to stand more than 10 minutes, uh, uh, given the circumstances with, with his leg. On the bench, uh, the debaters will be posed questions alternately. Each will be allowed three minutes to respond to the question, and the first, uh, the lead uh, responder will then be given a two-minute rebuttal opportunity. Other questions will then be posed. The audience is invited to write questions and submit them uh, for the debate if you desire to do so. Allison is at the back of the room. And uh, if you have a question, you can raise your hand and submit it on a paper you already have, or she can give you something to write on. These questions will be uh, submitted uh, to me during the course of the debate, and if it's appropriate to feather these questions in, I will do so. At the conclusion of the question and answer period, uh, each of the debaters will have a five-minute opportunity 
to make their closing argument, beginning first with General Shirtliff and then concluding with Professor Peterson. With that introduction, I uh, invite Professor Peterson to step to the podium. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to uh, Dean Chodash, uh, uh, Judge Maybe, and also uh, General Shirtleff for allowing me to participate in the debate with them. Uh, it's a tremendous honor for me to get to, to be here today and to get to share some views about uh, this debate topic. Uh, and I hope that I'm up to the task. I think it's a very distinguished group of people, and I'm not, I think, I think I may be the lightweight on the panel here, but I hope that I can uh, hang in there. Um, well, with that, um, I'd like to start out, uh, if I could, by um, talking just a little bit about Benjamin Franklin. It's probably a little bit of a peculiar place to start, but um, I, I like to share this quote uh, uh, with people because I think that it's uh, helpful to sort of set the stage for the arguments that I want to make. Um, and I'm going to make it, I'm going to drag you through and make you read it, which I know is going to be a little bit tedious, but just hang in there. It's worth it. So uh, this is what Benjamin Franklin said. Uh, uh, creditors have better memories than debtors. The day comes around uh, before you are aware, and the demand is made before you are prepared to satisfy it. Or if you bear your debt in mind, the term which at first seems so long will, as it lessens, appear extremely short. Uh, time will seem to have added wings to his heels as well as his shoulders. The borrower is a slave to the lender. Disdain the chain, preserve your freedom, maintain your independency, be industrious and free, be frugal and free. Now, you know, he says the word, free, he refers to freedom three times in that quote. And this is a guy who had something to say about freedom, who had thought about it. He was uh, a signatory to both the Declaration of Independence uh, and also the Constitution of the United States, and furthermore was the primary author and advocate of the, of the Bill of Rights. Uh, and what's more, in, in that war, uh, if, if they had lost, which was a close call, a close shave, he would have hung from the gallows. Uh, so he knew a little bit about freedom and whether or not that was something worthwhile to fight for. Um, well, in his home state of Pennsylvania, uh, the Pennsylvania legislature had passed a 6% usury limit, uh, one-sixth of, or you know, a sixth of, the, or not a sixth, but um, you know, significantly less than the usury limit that we're talking about in today's debate. And it wasn't just Pennsylvania, it was also Connecticut, Delaware, Georgia had an 8% cap. Uh, in fact, all of the 13 original colonies of the United States, every signatory to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States returned to states that had aggressive usury limits uh, and intervened aggressively in their, in their credit marketplace. Well, uh, so given that, sort of with this introduction, um, it, it's, it's with that political heritage in mind that I stand resolutely in affirmation of the 24th annual uh, Fordham Debate Resolution. In my view, interest rates and fees that amount to interest rates above 36 percent, such as those often made by credit card companies and payday lenders, should be prohibited. And in my short uh, uh, introductory statement here, I'd like to make three arguments. First, I'd like to speak a little bit about some historical arguments, uh, an, an economic argument, and also some philosophical points. So beginning my historical argument, I thought it might be worthwhile to put up what I believe is the very first predatory lending law in the history of the human species. Uh, it says, uh, if a merchant has given corn on loan, he may take 100 silla, whatever that is, uh, as interest on one gur. Or if he's given it on silver, he may take one sixth shekels, uh, six grain silver on one shekel of silver. What on earth is that talking about? Well, it turns out that that's the Babylonian Empire's usury law, and it placed a 20% simple nominal annual interest rate cap on loans of silver. Remember, this is silver because we hadn't, as a species, learned how to coin currency yet. We didn't have money, but before we figured out how, how, what money is, we had figured out we needed a 20% interest rate cap. <laughs> What's more, the, the credit cards that are in most of your pockets probably were illegal under Babylonian law. Uh, loans in grain had a little higher interest rate cap because presumably grain was, uh, uh, could uh, deteriorate and maybe there was some higher risks justifying a higher price cap. It wasn't just Babylon though. The Roman Empire had a 12% interest rate cap uh, throughout most of the empire. They changed it around a little bit. For most of, the, of, of Roman history, there was a 12% cap. The Chinese Empire, particularly in the Ming Dynasty, had a 36% interest rate cap. Of course, that evolved historically independent from the, the Judeo-Christian Western tradition. Uh, this is the Chinese figured out they needed a cap as well. 
Um, well, what about in the United States? I think that you can divide uh, usury law in America into three periods. The first period was the era of the colonial thrift ethic. This is the era of Benjamin Franklin that I talked about. And that era, which was uh, beginning in the 18th and through the 19th century, we had caps of between 5 and 12 percent annually. And in the 20th century, we decided that we needed a little bit more room to make loans to consumers. Uh, and most states uh, moved their interest rate caps up a little bit to the range between 18 and 42 percent. And throughout most of the country, those were the caps that were in place between about 1900 and, and, and 1978, beginning, I think, even later in the 1980s and 1990s. At that point, I think our country went into a, a deregulatory era where our laws fundamentally changed. Uh, and today, uh, our, our laws have went from a median of uh, a cap of 36%, which was prevalent in the 1960s, to today, the median interest rate cap around the United States is just under 400%. And many states, including our own state of Utah, have no limit on interest rates whatsoever. Well, since that happened, uh, the amount of debt that consumers are loading onto themselves has grown very steeply. This would be uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, ratio, uh, uh, the ratio of debt to income. Uh, uh, and you can see after 1990, when things really started to deregulate, uh, that's, that's risen dramatically. And it's not just debt in general. There are particularly troubling types of credit that have also been on the rise. It's worth mentioning a little bit about what payday loans are. Um, uh, how, how does a payday loan work? Many of you may not be familiar with it, but uh, in a typical transaction, a customer might go to uh, a payday loan store and write out a check, say, for $360. After they give the lender the check, the customer gets $300 in cash back. The check is post-dated two weeks in the future, meaning that uh, uh, the lender will agree to deposit the check in two weeks. If the check clears, it's a $60 finance charge for a two-week loan of $300. Uh, but if it doesn't clear, the the loan continues to accrue interest at $60 every two weeks and on and on and so on. And in addition, lenders frequently charge insufficient fund fees, late payment penalties, and other collection charges. This works out to be, these work out to be extremely expensive loans. The average simple nominal annual interest rates for payday loans are about 450% uh, around the country. And in Utah, it's likely to be higher than that because we have no interest rate cap whatsoever. The best study I've seen in Utah, I think it suggests it's about 520% here. Um, uh, payday loans also tend to uh, evolve into reoccurring debt patterns where the customer uh, can't manage to retire the entire debt in one month because they can't scratch together enough you know, $360. They can get $60 to service the interest, but they'll just keep paying that over and over and over. And frequently, frequently these loans end up uh, compounding for over a year. Um, uh, and what's more, uh, the average customer, now this is the average customer, repays about $793 for a typical loan of $325. So typical customers will pay back more than double the principal before they can successfully retire the debt. And what's more, payday customers are often members of groups that can least afford these high credit prices. Frequently, uh, low-income consumers, uh, people, you know, nurses, school teachers, clerks at grocery stores, construction workers, folks that are struggling to hold their families together and are on uh, the, the lower fringe of the middle class and at risk of falling uh, into serious poverty. Well, uh, and here's a chart. This is, compares the growth of Starbucks versus payday lenders. There's no relationship between the Starbucks coffee chain and payday lenders. But Starbucks is held up by many people as the paragon uh, in, in retail coffee. It transformed the coffee industry and had explosive growth. It seems like there's a Starbucks uh, location on every corner these days. Well, you can see that payday lenders grew much, much more rapidly. Uh, it just as a historical coincidence, they sort of took off at about the same time. Uh, but there are many more payday lenders around the country than there are Starbucks locations. And in fact, there are now more payday lender locations than there are McDonald's, Burger King, JCPenney, and Target stores combined. And what's more, in some counties, cities, and in fact, in the state of Mississippi, there are now more payday lenders than there are bank branch locations. This suggests a fundamental shift in the way that American uh, low and moderate income consumers receive their uh, financial services. And also, it, the same holds true for Utah. Uh, here's Salt Lake City's check, cla uh, check cash or classified listings from telephone directories. Uh, you can see it took off right in about 1990 and really exploded. Uh, well, my argument, historical argument then comes down to this. The past 15 years have been a dangerous and radical historical anomaly. Uh, it, it, speaking to that fact, if I could give one quick statistic, uh, the average simple nominal annual interest rate on New York City mafia loan shark syndicate loans was 250%. Now that's half the price of a typical payday loan in Salt Lake City, Utah. <laughs> 
Uh, now, I, I guess I better uh, hustle through my, I think I probably might be taking just a little bit too long, so I'll try and go quickly. Uh, my economic argument is this. The question is whether or not unregulated high cost, the, the unregulated uh, uh, high cost consumer credit market is efficient. And in my view, it's not. Uh, and here's why. I think there are information imperfections that remove the incentive for consumers to comparison shop. I think that there are non-welfare maximizing behaviors that lead consumers into self-destructive behavior. People are tempted into making decisions that don't serve their own best interests. And what's more, many consumers are desperate and make not the best decisions about their own welfare. And finally, social costs of uh, payday loans are borne not only by the individuals, but also by their communities, their neighborhoods, and also their families. Frequently, the, the, most, the most important victims of high cost lending are the children of, of the debtors themselves. Uh, finally, a philosophical argument. Market competition, I think everybody in the room is in favor of market competition, but there's a difference between market competition and market anarchy. There's nothing wrong with having reasonable limits on civilized behavior within a, 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 w within a marketplace. Finally, our ancient moral heritage condemns usurious lending. And I, I, I don't mean to sort of inject religion into a, a secular debate, but here's a, here's a quote from the Bible. The Bible said, hath given forth upon usury, hath taken increase, shall he then live? He shall not live. He hath done all these abominations, he surely he shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. Um, clearly, the Bible had something serious to say about uh, usurious lenders. And I think there might be counsel even for non-religious folks uh, in those words. Finally, I think that a reasonable limit would promote a free and industrious society. Uh, speaking one last time to Benjamin Franklin as I close, uh, it seems to me that it's an interesting irony that this picture is taken from the $100 bill, uh, uh, the very currency that's likely to be paid out in many payday loan and, and, and credit card uh, transactions. Somehow it seems that our country has forgotten a deep American wisdom known and embraced by Benjamin Franklin. Freedom is not just the absence of government power. Indeed, no one is free in an anarchy because everyone has to look over their shoulder. Uh, we have forgotten that usurious loans are a form of political tyranny no less meaningful to the afflicted than that of King George himself. Reasonable price limits preserve freedom because they tend to prevent Americans from falling into debt servitude. In our best collective ambitions, we were supposed to be uh, the home of the brave and the land of the free, not the land of the indentured. Uh, that's why I believe uh, we should establish a clear limit on payday loans and credit cards of 36% uh, annual. Thank you. Good evening, Dean Chorosh, Judge Maybe, Professor Peterson, uh, Mrs. Fordham, and students and friends. Thank you for this great honor to be here. I've been uh, I'm in my eighth year now as Attorney General, and I, I'm honored that I finally get a chance to be invited to the Fordham debate. Professor Fordham was a mentor of mine. I was a student here, and, uh, and he, this, this legacy that he left, and now each year come back to, uh, to honor him and his memory and what he taught uh, by taking on some big issues and discussing them. Uh, now, by the way, welcome to law school. You're all in law school tonight, which means you, uh, you leave your preconceived notions, your prejudices, your sound bites at the door. And uh, if you come into law school with those, then there's good professors who will soon whip it, beat it out of you through uh, intimidation. And no, I'm kidding. But uh, I know there are a number of lawyers here who swore they would never come back to law school. But uh, it was a great experience for me here at this college. And uh, I want you to, to feel tonight that you're here to learn. Uh, they're uh, one, of, one of my the people I like to quote the most is Marcus Aurelius. My grandmother called me Marcus Aurelius growing up. I didn't know what it meant, me, meant until I, I learned about the emperor, Marcus Aurelius, and philosopher. But he said, he said this, and I think this is what frames the debate tonight. Show me or convince me that I am wrong in my thought or deed, and I will gladly change. For there is no harm in change. The only harm is remaining in ignorance. Uh, I hope that you'll have open minds tonight that we, as we look at both ends of this proposition, this is an important issue right now, particularly as we're looking at this election this year. The economy has risen so quickly to the top as one of the big problems with this looming recession, with Congress trying to bail out problems that resulted from uh, uh, serious problems in the subprime, subprime mortgage industry, issues related to debt. And, uh, and so it's a very important topic that we discuss tonight. Uh, I. Uh, I will tell you that I, I was asked to oppose or to take the negative on this. I've done a lot of study on the issue. As Attorney General, I felt I had a responsibility to do the study. Uh, when issues are brought to me, and many years ago, 
several um, representatives of low income and poverty groups came to me to tell me uh, about the problems with the payday lending in industry. And uh, I heard a parade of horribles. I heard a lot of really bad information that shocked and alarmed me. So the first thing I did uh, to try and inform myself as to the facts was go to my, one of my assistant attorneys general. We have a couple of them here tonight. Uh, we have over 200 amazing professionals who I rely on uh, day in and day out as I serve the people of the state. Uh, and of course my attorney said, I'll get right back to you. She went to her client, the Division of Finance, and asked about this. So we've heard these, these, these stories about the problem with payday lending. Please, can you uh, tell us if there's a problem? And, and the Division of Finance came back and said, you know what, for our, the all the people we regulate, we hardly get any complaints. And so I said, well, what's, why then are there no complaints? And I, and I needed to inform further and began that, that study. Is this... Uh, let me ch change this real quick. Hang on. All right. Figured it out. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'll take the applause for the, it's about the only one I'll get tonight, I think. Um, I pose a resolution on the, uh, on the grounds that by this prohibition, uh, and, and it's really overreaching government interaction in the free marketplace has been proven, and I'm going to show you tonight, hopefully during the debate, has been proven to be anti-competitive, therefore anti-consumer, and therefore harmful to the consumers and the very people who need these loans uh, to get by. And I'm going to do a little history myself. Uh, I appreciate the uh, reference to Benjamin Franklin. I'm, I'm a great uh, lover of history. And what frames my responsibilities as Attorney General was set forth from the very, very beginning in, in uh, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. My jobs are to establish justice, uh, critical to the night, promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty that were promised in the Declaration and, and in the Constitution. We're going to focus on the welfare of the people. And of course, we all knew that didn't mean social welfare like we see it today, but the responsibility to promote the welfare of the people and to support those things that would help enhance the welfare. And, and of course, for free market, uh, we know and have learned in this country and throughout history that a free market is the best way to promote the general welfare. Beginning with Adam Smith in 1776, talking about the invisible hand that moved the marketplace with less government regulation and people able to interact with one another, to compete, to create products, and therefore to give more choices to the consumer. You can see John Stuart Mill uh, talking about producers and sellers being perfectly free to uh, produce products. This free market, also called capitalism by some, has come under a lot of fire of late. But really, uh, a study of this country and the history of, of the world shows that capitalism has created the highest standard of living. We talk about the poor and the needy. We have them here. We do, here in this beautiful valley. But compared to the poor and the needy throughout the history of time, uh, ours are relatively well off. Nevertheless, not completely, and we do have a, a responsibility towards them. Uh, I, I've pulled in, I don't have a lot of time to go through Milton Friedman. I thought I'd, I'd pull out a non-economist and Pope John Paul II, who said free market is the most efficient instrument for utilizing resources and effectively responding to needs. Greed is good. You've heard, uh, you remember uh, the, the Michael uh, Douglas role in saying greed is good. Well, there was this great article written. It was, it was really a satire by Mr. Kinsley in defense of excess. But uh, he said, you know, greed is not really good. Actually, it's, it's inevitable. It's part of the human condition. If it's in moderation, economists and historians will argue that greed is really not a bad thing because it motivates people to, to produce, to, to create wealth. He said, we wouldn't uh, be successful if we were all Mother Teresa. Um, Capitalism is a system designed for sinners, said Michael Novak, and the hope is achieving as much moral good as individual communities can generate under conditions of ample liberty. And uh, John Maynard Keynes also talking about these animal spirits, he called them. Someone calls it greed, another animal spirit. Uh, actually, Michael <coughs> Novak calls it a, a virtuous self-interest. What motivates people to get out there and, and uh, produce? As Milton Friedman again said, what kind of society isn't structured on greed? The pro problem of social organization is how to set up an arrangement under which greed will do the least harm. Capitalism is that kind of system. Uh, Michael Kinsley in his Time article went on to say, it's kind of like Goldilocks. It's just not, 
just not too much greed, not too little greed, just the right amount of greed. Again, somewhat tongue in cheek. But here's the key. This is what he went on to say, and the point is that I want to make tonight. There is nothing inherent in the human condition. I think there are in some that they, that they have lived by a set of principles and rules, and they will cap their greed. They won't let it go to the point of hurting other people in order to satisfy that greed. But others there are not, and therefore we must have laws to keep them in moderation. So I, I believe the great two pillars of what makes our country great and continues to be great is a vibrant free market economy and then the rule of law. And sometimes those two have to come together. And the attorneys general, I couldn't help but put up a picture of my candidate because he's going to lose here in Utah here pretty soon. But this was funny because years ago when the attorneys general, realizing our responsibility under the rule of law to protect consumers, sued Big Tobacco, huge multi-billion dollar settlement. We went after Microsoft and then Wall Street, and then the energy, and then pharmaceuticals. And about that point, Senator McCain said, who do these people think they are? These attorneys general going around suing everybody. We have a responsibility in that, to, in protecting consumers. But my proposition is that a free market, a free and vibrant market, best protects consumers. Uh, and I, I love this quote, America's great is because she is good. There will those who will argue, and the people who want this type of proposition, who want to shut down an entire industry, it's because they believe it's evil. And it's not good. And, and they come to me saying, it's evil. You, Attorney General, ought to be with us shutting this down. Well, what we need to discuss and, un and uncover is, is usury evil? And what is usury? Well, Blackstone, who many of you have studied, said, well, the increase by some is called interest. Others who think that interest is unlawful call it usury. So there, there are both kinds. Good interest, something that promotes the welfare as required to do under the Constitution, is good interest. I don't think there's a proposition here to do away with any lending, any borrowing, or any interest. Although you would argue, some, they might argue, that any interest is usury. How much is usury? 1%? 36%? 1,000%? What is bad about usury is when, or interest is when it becomes welfare reducing, not welfare enhancing the people. Shakespeare went back a little further, don't be a borrow lender. I actually went all the way back before Hammurabi to 3,000 years ago, the city of Uruk. <laughs> Clay tablets, financial transactions, interest. The Sumerians before Hammurabi uh, were the first to develop this use of cows. And if you lent someone your cow, they had to give you a calf back. That was the interest. You could use cows as interest. Of course, the court of Hammurabi provided for interest and loans up to 33%. Come up to the pilgrims' time, the pilgrims understood installments and, and loans and credit obligations in the range between 30 and 70 percent. Uh, the reason why I think Benjamin Franklin talked about debt leading to a, a, a lack of freedom, because back in those days you didn't pay your debt, you went to jail. The, the, it was spelled G-A-O-L, gal, the jail. Here's a copy of, from 1802 that shows a guy who was in prison for a debt of $1.68. So this history of credit and debt, there's people have had options. People have always borrowed. They've always needed to. And through time, they've had options. You've got the, the, the debtor prison, symbol of uh, pawnbrokers. You've got the loan shark on the corner. Or, you know, a little house in the prairie when they needed something, they went over to the, the Olson store and had something put on their tab. But here we are today, and I know my time is up. But uh, the reality check I want you to see is that there are people who are like this. And, and it's not their whole lives, but the statistics, in fact, show that it, they will reach a point, maybe because they have little children and something happens and they just need that little bit to stay afloat, but they've gotten so involved in credit cards and everything else that they need help. They need something. Where do they go? As a doggy paddling, there's three options. Payday loan industry, the bounce check industry, and the late fee check protection industry. And you can see... I don't know why we're going after just one industry, where late fee check protection industry is a $46 billion a year industry. Bounce checks. Don't worry about it. We'll take care of you. Just pay a fee. $40 billion business. Petty loans, $4.2 billion industry. Um, I'm going to have to end here. Maybe I'll use the rest of my slides in, in my closing if we, can, if we can do that. But the point I want to, to, to make tonight is that payday loans are welfare enhancing, that there is a need. Payday lenders didn't create the need, but there was a need for people to, who didn't want to go and, and take out more credit, who didn't want to pawn all their, their wife's wedding ring, who didn't want to go to a loan shark and risk having their legs broken if they didn't pay back. That is the one difference is that I don't think payday lenders are breaking people's legs, like the loan sharks. So, to find, so pawning reduces 
welfare. Getting a chance to get by with the payday loan enhances welfare. And that'll be my proposition tonight as we go through the questions. Thank you for your interest. I look forward to the debate. I will ask the uh, first question first to General Shirtliff. I'll remind the debaters uh, that we do have a clock here. It shows three minutes for each answer. Um, uh, and let's try to adhere to that. General Shirtliff, if these high interest loans were prohibited, what would be the effect, intended or unintended, upon consumers, their families, and their communities? Thank you, Judge Maybe it, uh, This is a very important question because while the proposition is not to prohibit outright payday lending in the state of Utah, like it has been done in some states, you have to understand that research has been done to show and you can, and any state that has put a 36% cap, as the proposition suggests, on payday lending shuts down the business in the state. So the proposition tonight, if, if, uh, if it were to be passed as a law in Utah and capped at 36%, would in fact prohibit payday loans. And what would be the result? You know, we don't have to guess about this. This is, this is the good thing. There's been a lot of talk and speculation and study over the last several years. As you can see with that rise that Professor Peterson told you about, there hasn't been time to do a lot of study. But it's been several years now, uh, many years since Georgia, North Carolina outlawed or, or did away with payday loans. And so the uh, staff, a staff uh, employee of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York just this past uh, November finished a, a very detailed economic staff report for the, the Federal Reserve Bank. And he looked at Georgia, he looked at South Carolina, North Carolina, and found out what happened to these people who needed these loans and were taking these loans, but then suddenly were cut off from the ability to take the loans. Uh, what happened? And this is what he found. Households that have this, these, the, this risky, uh, these risky lives, so to speak, um, had some major problems. They noticed a uh, substantial increase in the number, substantial, like in the millions of complaints to the Federal Reserve and to the, uh, to the FTC on, uh, on nasty debt collectors harassing them. Foreclosures went up. People started losing their houses more. And, uh, and in addition, uh, they, they started missing their debt payments. They started bouncing checks all over the place. So you see, what, what the, the states and those uh, did is they took away a reasonable option. They took away an alternative to credit cards, to, to, to pawning, and to other, these other problems that people uh, uh, realized. Um, let me just tell you some of the facts. They said on the average, the Federal Reserve Check Processing Center in Atlanta, Georgia, returned 1.2 million more checks per year after the ban. At $30 per item, now remember the return check fees, depositors paid an extra 36 million per year in bounce check fees. You didn't do away with the bounce checks industry or the or the other industries that provide these services, sometimes at great expense, you did away with one of them, which means you reduced the opportunity of people to take that opportunity. Complaints began to rise and rose to 64% more complaints than before the ban. And finally, they looked at Hawaii, which didn't reduce it, but they actually doubled the amount of petty loans that you could receive. And they went over there to see what happened. And in fact, Hawaiians' debt problems declined and became less chronic after Hawaii doubled the maximum legal dose of payday credit in 2003. Thank you. Professor Peterson? Um, well, <clears throat> I guess that most of the comments were about the, the Donald Morgan study, which I'm sure nobody's read. But I, I've read it, and I'm not especially impressed with the Morgan study. First of all, um, Donald Morgan, it's, it's not uh, a Federal Reserve Bank of New York study. It's, a, it's an employee, a banker, who happens to work there that wrote a study in his part you know, sort of spare time. And it hasn't been published, and it hasn't been subject to peer review. It's only been floated around on the internet, sort of tentatively. So, but that I mean, that doesn't mean anything. But talking specifically about the study, what it does is it talks about 
uh, uh, regional uh, bounce check uh, rates at, at two, in two cities, Charlotte and Atlanta, North Carolina and Georgia both banned payday loans. So the idea is that if, if those rates went up, and that means that, that payday loans are causing more bounced checks. The problem is, is that uh, 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 Charlotte and Atlanta process checks not just from North Carolina and Atlanta, but also from those states around them. So for example, Atlanta also processes checks from Louisiana, a state that allows payday loans, and also suffered Hurricane Katrina in the time period that uh, the study took place. Hurricane Katrina was likely to cause a few bounced checks. So for all we know, all of Morgan's results are attributable in Atlanta to Hurricane Katrina in Louisiana. Furthermore, in North Carolina, uh, uh, that also includes Virginia data and South Carolina data, which are, are two states that still facilitate payday lending. So uh, it, it could be the case that there's more payday lending going on in North Carolina, excuse me, in Virginia and South Carolina, and that's what the cause of the increase in complaints are. So I think that the study is deeply flawed. Also, um, uh, it talks about Federal Trade Commission complaints increasing after payday lending was banned, but the Federal Trade Commission doesn't have jurisdiction over usury limits. So the FTC doesn't even have jurisdiction. So why would people complain to the FTC if that's not even the regulator that addresses the problem? Um, first, furthermore, most FTC complaints are caused by identity theft, which really doesn't have that much to do with payday lending. Identity theft is you know, when somebody steals your identity and then you complain to the FTC that somebody's pretending to be me. That's a different issue. So I don't really think that there's any traction in explaining the results of payday lending based on that, uh, uh, that data point. And then the last is there was some argument that bankruptcy rates uh, may have increased following, um, uh, uh, excuse me, may have declined following uh, uh, the ban of payday lending in those two states. But my view is that that's much more likely to be dwarfed by the changes in the bankruptcy code. In 2005, you may recall that, that Congress dramatically limited access to the, bankrupt, to, bank, to the bankruptcy system. And my guess is that's the real reason why bankruptcy declined. So I'm not especially impressed with that study. And then finally, there are a lot of other better studies that speak more to that issue. For example, the North Carolina Commissioner of Banks, in conjunction with uh, a professor at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, uh, uh, did a survey of customers that uh, that were getting payday loans before the ban, and all of the uh, the vast majority of customers in, in North Carolina said they were better off without it. Um, and 90% of the of the consumers in the survey said that payday loans were a terrible thing and were bad for them. And this is just a quote of one of the customers. She they asked you, so what did you like payday lending? Is it better now that they're that they're gone? And, and she said, thank you, Jesus. I, now I can't do it anymore. And they asked her if it was uh, a hardship. She said, no, no, no. I think it's good that we got rid of them. They're basically there to rob people that need money. They're the devil. Uh, and most of the participants in the study were glad that they no longer had that temptation. Uh, uh, so um, that's my response. General Shirtliff, would you like to respond? I would. Just a couple of things. Um, the, um, the complaints were specifically against debt collectors. These weren't other complaints about FTC type uh, problems. And, and, how, and they, he tracked how those, uh, how those complaints had changed and how, the, how they had gone up. These are complaints exaggerating the amount or legal status of debts, 43%. You see, doing away with the payday industry in that state didn't do away with debt collectors. Okay? Calling continuously before 8 or 9, up, up 24%. Repeatedly calling family, friends, and neighbors. Obscene language. False threats or dire consequences, probably from the loan sharks. Impermissible calls to employers. Revealing debt to third parties. Threatened violence, even. They all went up. And it's because what you have, again, let me just, again, have you focus on who we're talking about here. The truth is that, that payday customers while they may be less sophisticated, they, they know what they're doing. See, because they've been doing this for a while. They know what their options are. And they've had problems with, I've, I've gone to my family so many times, I just can't go to them again. I pawned, I've hawked half the stuff in our house. It, it's, it's just not working, I'm not getting it back. I'm losing property. Therefore, my welfare is being reduced. What do I do? They're robbing Peter to pay Paul, so to speak. Uh, and and they need something. And, and what you do by taking away just one option and leaving the high fees of bounced checks, you, you know that if, if uh, the, the Chicago Bank, banks estimated that the implicit APR, average percentage rate, which we seem to focus on so much, and we'll get around to that in a minute as to why that's really not a proper way to, to, to calculate what these fees are for payday, payday loans, but you're left with bounced checks. Guess what the APR is on Bounce check protection, 2,400%. So you put out a business, somebody offering it much other, much cheaper loans and only left them with something that was more expensive. 
free market. You did away with one choice, which allows the others then to charge the consumer more, and it hurts consumers in that regard. Thank you. Professor Peterson, with more than 400 payday lender outlets in Utah and hundreds more available on the Internet, why doesn't someone offer these loans at interest rates less than 36 percent and put everyone else out of business? In other words, why isn't this the market rate? And in that connection, isn't it a fact that uh, bounce check rates are much, much higher? Would you limit those to 36 percent? Well, to the last, yeah, I'd, I'd limit those to 36 percent, too. I mean, I'm not, I'm not an apologist for bounce check fees. I, why not make those a little more reasonable, too? I, I don't see a reason why not to. But speaking to the, to the real thrust of the question, which is, um, you know, if, if there are all these lenders that are charging these high prices, why doesn't somebody enter into the marketplace and outcompete them by offering lower prices? Well, I, you know, I think in terms of credit availability of societies, we could sort of put a spectrum. You know, maybe maybe the societies that have virtually no credit available at all. You know, maybe maybe I don't know Maoist China, um, uh, some of the other totalitarian regimes, um, and, and and on the far end of that spectrum spectrum would be the current United States. We have all sorts of credit available. Um, you know, there are billions of credit card solicitations uh, that are issued every year with all sorts of different opportunities for people to borrow money. Uh, and you know, some of those credit cards have lower interest rates and are more reasonable credit options. Uh, also, credit unions offer a lot of decent loans to people. They're harder to get because uh, you have to be, you know, you have to be a little more credit worthy. Um, and, and also, an alternative that I think um, that you know. I'm not a big fan, you know, friend to the pawnbroker uh, industry, but I think that pawn, pawn loans are better loans. Um, for example, because the, the security for the loan is held by the lender, if you don't pay the loan back, then they get to keep your TV. And guess what? You are probably better off without the TV anyway. <laughs> Um, so it's easier for pawnbrokers to make profit uh, at a much lower interest rate. And what's more, uh, one of the things about pawn loans that makes them a little bit less popular with people that want fast cash, easy money now, is that they have to give up something. It's not all, uh, uh, you know, all goodness today, badness tomorrow. There's a little bit of badness today. A little bit of discipline on the market would probably be good for people. Uh, my sense is that is that uh, if if the marketplace uh, prevented uh, uh, loans above 36% interest rates, payday lenders would dry up. They would go out of business. Uh, and frankly, I, I don't think that's a loss to society. We'd be better off without them, just like we were in the Great Depression and the Second World War. Um, you know, we got through those times just fine without those kinds of loans. And people could go to pawn shops, credit unions, and do the best that they can. And also, here's another idea. Maybe we could try and pull up our pioneer bootstraps uh, and work a little bit on managing our money so we don't get into bounce check situations to begin with. Thank you. General Shirtliff. Thank you. Well, obviously, the, it's answered there. In a free market, and this is a highly competitive business. We've seen, you've seen the numbers, how they've grown. Over 400 uh, outlets, or stores, storefronts in, in Utah. Highly competitive business. If, you, if they could do it at 36% or something else, they would. And that, and, and, and that would be good for consumers. The bottom line is the facts show that, that it can't, can't happen. If you calculate, if you put a 36% rate, I think most people think, okay, if it's a $100 loan and you, put, you cap it at 36%, you can charge me 36 bucks. That's not what it is. If people go, 36 bucks, you can do your overhead and take care of your risk and pay, turn on the lights. No. If you calculate the 36% out on an APR, which is what they do the other way to say this is a 300% loan, the problem that is, is, is that you've only earned $1.28. On that hundred dollars, and it is, and it is very clear. Um, it, there's no dispute on this because there, you can look at every store. These stores can't stay open at 36 um, percent. My understanding, on average, is that that uh, that right now the cost of overhead, the cost of risk, and remember, this is a very risky group. That's why they're coming to you, and payday lenders have to assume that risk. And there's a cost to that, and there's cost in litigation and everything else in trying to collect. On average, it costs the costs are somewhere between $14 and $15. And on average, you charge $15 on a $100 loan. So it goes to show that they're, they're not, they're not uh, it, it's not possible, and they will go out of business. Uh, let me just say this, uh, this from the, again, the Morgan Federal Reserve staff report. And you can poke holes at it and say, well, I don't think it's a very good report, but it's statistical. It, it, they have all the backup information, and it's, it's an economic formula that, that they apply. And they've said that we find that households with uncertain income, that's who we're dealing with here, people with uncertain income, 
who are the so-called potential prey, um, in payday states have higher debt but not higher delinquency. This is very important. They don't have higher delinquency. Just the opposite, in fact. Households, and I'm quoting, with uncertain income who live in states with unlimited payday loans tend to have slightly lower delinquency rates, and they are less likely to report being credit restrained. That is welfare enhancing. Pawning is, is welfare destroying. You, you get nothing. You lose your property. See, the good thing about, about if, if you, it's a good thing about the payday loan is there's no credit impact at all if you default on the loan. You don't lose your house, you don't lose your TV, you don't lose your guitar, you don't lose your wife's wedding ring, you don't have a foreclosure on your home. There is no impact on your credit. That's, and that's why I say it's credit enhancing, or excuse me, welfare enhancing. And quite frankly, I don't think the government should be telling us, and I'm the government, <laughs> shouldn't be telling us, yeah, you're better off living without a TV and I'm gonna make that decision for you by taking away an option that would allow you to keep your TV and still get by in those times of need. Professor Peterson, would you like to respond? Um, sure. Well, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, we're going back on this Morgan study. I'm sure nobody cares about it. But I, another thought that I, another thing I wanted to mention was that it doesn't do any, it doesn't, it doesn't control for the subprime mortgage crisis, which is rocking the economy right now, right? I mean, it's a, it's a huge part of what's going on. And it doesn't do, it doesn't have any variables that try and separate out the effects of subprime mortgage lending from uh, the effects of, of the payday lending bans in those two states. Um, so I, I'm just not persuaded by any of the data in that study personally, and I agree, you know, that, that I mean, it's, I'm sure he's a nice guy. I, I don't mean to, you know. <laughs> um, Can I? Yeah, no, I'm sorry, I don't, go ahead, please. Judge, may I just, yeah, since you don't like. Please, I'll, I'll yield my time, go ahead. Since you don't like Mr. Morgan, let me quote I from, love him, he's a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> Since you don't like him, uh, or you like him, he's a nice guy, but you don't trust his, uh, his study. Let me just quote from Tom Lehman. He's a PhD, associate professor of economics, in a, in a paper uh, produced 2006, Payday Lending and Public Policy, What Elected Officials Should Know. And this, I found this very interesting, being an elected official. And he, he concluded, the research to date does not demonstrate that payday lending is predatory or that it leads to excessive delinquency among borrowers. Professor Peterson, did you want to say further with respect to this? He's a nice guy, too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like his study either, <laughs> but I won't talk about that. Um, I I, I, the General Shirtliff uh, argued that there's no credit impact from defaults and payday loans, and I disagree with that. Um, if, if a consumer defaults on a payday loan, they'll be charged, they'll be instantly charged an insufficient funds fee, which is, a, you know, which are very high, it's like $25, something like that. Also, a late payment fee will typically be charged. Um, uh, and in addition, they have to continue servicing the debt at, at an interest rate of 520% or thereabouts. And what's more, all of the, all of the contracts include uh, provisions allowing them to collect attorney's fees. Fees. So frequently what the lenders will do is allow the loan to accumulate up until it gets to the jurisdictional limit of small claims court. So what that means is if you're suing somebody for, say, $3,000, it's different in different states, but, but if you're suing for less than $3,000, then you can sue in small claims court and, uh, uh, and you don't have to go through all the, you know, the rigmarole of regular court. So they'll wait till it gets up to that limit and they'll file it in small claims court and they'll, and they'll ladle on another three or $400 in attorney's fees uh, for, the, for the process of going through that. It could be a a lot of money, and once they once they get that judgment, which they usually will, because the payday lender or the borrower will be too embarrassed to show up, or won't you know, for whatever reason won't show up to court, they'll get a default judgment, and then they'll start garnishing the cons the customer's wages. Uh, if they have a car that uh, has a certain value in some states, they'll go after and take their car. Um, so you know, I, I just and, and what's more, that 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 judgment goes into their credit report uh, for the big three credit reporting agencies. So I think it has very severe um, uh, uh, impact for consumers. Oh, and one other thing is that the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, the federal statute that requires minimum standards of decency and collection of debts, only applies to third-party debt collection agencies. It doesn't apply to somebody that's just a creditor collecting their own debt. So that rule doesn't, that, that statute doesn't apply to, to um, uh, uh, payday lenders. And there's not an equivalent statute in, uh, in, in Utah. So I, I think there are impacts. You know, aren't you missing an argument, Professor Peterson, that you could go to jail for passing a bad check? Uh, well, that's happened on payday loans. It, but be okay. that as it may, uh, <laughs> let, let me just just ask you, General Shirtliff, uh, uh, let's uh, 
interrupt here for a moment to ask if there is a year, if there is a limit on the accrual of payday interest in Utah. There is a limit on the number of times you can get take a loan in a year. Uh, and I support, frankly, the some, some strict disclosure laws and, and some limitations on rollovers. Uh, We'll find that most people get into trouble is when they roll over to the 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 times in a year. So a reasonable limit on the number of rollers I think is very appropriate. My understanding from the uh, Community Financial Services uh, Association, Payday Lenders Associations, is that uh, they have best practices and, and uh, the, uh, ask all the stores who belong to the association to limit, I think, to four rollovers a year, being concerned about the spiraling out of control when they get too many rollovers. I uh, ask you now, General Shirtliff, this question. Are stricter disclosure laws and better financial education the answer to any perceived problem with high-interest consumer loans? Are consumers rational in this respect? Uh, well, they, they aren't often, and that's why they get into trouble. Uh, and sometimes they aren't as sophisticated. Uh, you know, when I uh, uh, recently a reporter did a, a story and said that there were 130 complaints to the Division of Finance in the last three years about payday loans. Now, statistically in Utah, there have been about a million transactions a year. So 130 complaints out of 3 million, what's that? More than one one-hundredth of one percent of complaints. Uh, and, and, I, and when I asked about it, they said, uh, people who, who say, try to describe that say, well, these people who get them are all unsophisticated and they're, they're afraid to go and complain. Well, some people are, some people aren't. Generally speaking, they know, they, they can calculate, and they, and they come in there absolutely intending to pay back that, that loan, to pay the whole $345, for example, that they've written the check out for in order to get the $300. And they've miscalculated a little bit about their ability to do so. And so I don't think there's any problem. In fact, let me just make this very clear about predatory lending. There is predatory lending. It's, it's wealth reducing, it's immoral, it's illegal. And, and, but, but predatory lending includes over lending and overcharging and deception and taking advantage of people who are in trouble and need of help and tricking them or manipulating them into something they really can't control. So it's absolutely important, I believe, to have these, as you say, these you know, disclosure laws. So when someone comes in the store, there's a poster there on the wall that, that tells them, uh, you know, what the, what the, the, these are high-risk loans, what they're required to pay back. Um, they, they need to understand what those rules are and what the limitations are. Uh, I, I believe that uh, payday lenders ought to take responsibility. I think they, many do because these are their customers. They want them to come back on, on maybe even providing some free financial counseling, um, some education about how to deal with these things so that they can be successful in, in getting through this, this period where they're just trying to keep their head above water. So absolutely, I think they ought to do that. In fact, the attorneys general of this country, before everybody started hearing about the subprime mortgage debacle, we went after household finance company and sued them in 50 states and required them to pay over $400 million in fees and fines and, and, and trying to make some people whole. In addition to that, we placed on them a whole burden of requirements that we worked with them to develop uh, like secret shoppers, for example, uh, where you go, where you go in, and on your own, you pr you have someone come in and pretend uh, that they're, you're there to to take out a loan, and you, you go through the process just to see if you're being informed. So full disclosure, transparency, absolutely, these are all important. And I don't think there's a problem with imposing them. I'd rather the industry impose it on itself in a free market system, but in certain times, if they don't, I think it's appropriate for the government to do so. Professor Peterson, would disclosure solve the problem? Well, I think that disclosure is a useful thing. I, I'm not opposed to disclosure. Um, and I'm also not opposed to financial education, the other thing that you mentioned. But my sense is that uh, the current disclosures that we have frequently come too late in the process. Uh, and they don't help lots of the people that need things the most, for, need help the most. For example, if you're mentally ill or have some sort of emotional disorder, frequently you know, that the disclosure is not going to be helpful to you. What if you're addicted to drugs or you're addicted to gambling uh, uh, or, or have a desperation, right? You know, you're, you're having a hard time finding some something to feed your kids with. You know, you're still going to be willing to take on those risks, uh, uh, perhaps, even if you get disclosures. As far as financial education goes, my sense is that, is that 
financial edu education is a great idea, but it's an even better excuse not to uh, intervene on behalf of consumers. I mean, that's what schools are for. We're, the schools are out there trying to do their best to teach people to read and teach people math and teach people financial education, but it's not so easy. Um, I mean, I've dedicated my life to teaching, right? So I believe in education, but it's not a panacea. It's not like we're going to one day suddenly wake up and everybody's going to be financially educated and will not use payday loans anymore. Another thing, the Attorney General mentioned that there aren't very many complaints about payday loans uh, that, are, that are received by the government. But I don't think that people know that they can complain. And what's more, I don't think that people complain because why would they? The government doesn't bring any lawsuits on their behalf and get restitution for payday loan overcharges. So what's the point of complaining if nothing good is going to come from it? Maybe that explains why they're not complaining. Also, the, the General uh, Shirtliff suggested that predatory lending is wrong. And of course, we agree about that. The question is, what constitutes predatory lending? My historical argument in, in the beginning, in my, in my opening statement, was that by any reasonable historical standard, 520% interest rate loans are predatory loans. Certainly, uh, a generation ago, if you charged more than 200, if you, you know, when the mob was charging 250%, the attorneys general, the FBI, were rounding those people up and putting them in Sing Sing. Uh, you know, they were wiretapping to try and throw those people into prison. Certainly, when they were making those loans, it was predatory. And then uh, finally, there's the mention of Household Finance Corporation. And I, I think that the Attorney General did a good job in signing on to that uh, case, and I think that it was a good outcome for consumers. On the other hand, it dealt with mortgage loans rather than smaller term, uh, shorter term loans like payday loans and credit card debts. And what's more, it didn't, it wasn't really enough. Congress needed to step in. As we see now, uh, the mortgage lending situation has really fallen apart because Congress, the Federal Reserve Board, and also I think maybe to some degree the state legislatures didn't step in and try and prevent the kind of practices that caused that problem to begin with. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Do you wish to? Say something in rebuttal. I do. And first, I want to, we have to make something really clear here because we, we can talk all day about uh, the mafia charging you 200%. And the problem is, is you can't use the 300 plus percent APR on these loans because in order to, for that to be a truthful comparison, you would have to take out a, a loan, three, let's say $300, and pay $4,500 fee, $15 per $100, which is kind of an average. And you would have to roll that loan over every two weeks for an entire year before it reached that 360, whatever the percentage APR is. And that just does not happen in the industry. And so that's why you say put reasonable caps on rollovers and everything else. But, but that's the key. So to keep saying that a $15 charge on a $100 loan equals 300 plus percent APR is, is incorrect. It's, it's, a, it's a falsehood, and, it, and, it, and it's just used by those who want to shut down the industry. Can I respond to that? Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, first of all, an annual percent, it's not just me. The Federal Truth in Lending Act, the, Cong the statute passed by Congress, uses an annual percentage rate. And we all use annual percentage rates. When you say, what's the interest rate? Almost all of us mean an annual percentage rate. And when we talk about mortgages, 30-year mortgages, do we talk about a 30-year interest rate? No, we talk about what, a year interest rate. Uh, and, and what's more, we use annual interest rates when we talk about credit cards as well. The reason that we talk about it in terms of one year is because there has to be some uniform metric with which we can compare prices of different loans, so we're all talking about the same measure of, of or the same scale. Otherwise, it would be, be like we're trying to compare prices or, or compare distances on the metric system versus uh, you know, inches. Uh, it's, just, it's just a convention for, for talking about it. And second, even if, even if I'm wrong about that, and we don't, as a normal matter, talk about interest rates in terms of years, payday loans do do compound for uh, more than a year, frequently. Um, for example, uh, uh, there's a study by the Colorado Commissioner on Consumer Credit in 1999 reporting instances of 13 rollovers per year. Uh, 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 there's the Department of, Illinois Department of Financial Institutions said that average payday loan customers borrow 13 times per year and remain indebted for at least six months. That's the average borrower. Uh, there's an Indiana Department of Financial Institutions study that says that 77% of payday, loan, uh, payday loans are rollovers of pre-existing loans suggesting that they compound for longer periods of time. So my sense is that all of the empirical evidence indicates that these loans frequently do in, uh, compound for uh, 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 durations comparable to a year. Anything further? I, would, I was going to make another point um, beyond the APR issue, although I will say this. What the, the, the concern I continue to have is that why are we focusing on just one industry that provides financing, help, credit to those who are in this period of need? 
and, and not apply the exact same criteria to the bounce check fee industry and the return check fee industry and the pay, pay, paycheck protection industry and all these who, who's, who also charge fees but for whatever little loophole in the, the federal law don't have to say this is a $2,400, excuse me, 2,400% APR if you calculated it out. So again, it's, it's like there, for whatever reason, there's, there's those who are targeting one part of that community, that the, the, the free market that is providing these services and allowing others and, and giving, again, taking away choice from individuals. I, I did want to say this, and this may sound a little harsh, uh, because we talked about who these people are who need these loans. And uh, maybe they're unsophisticated and won't understand or possibly um, have emotional problems or mental problems. But the question is, is is, is it, what is the proper role of government? When should we step in to protect people from themselves, to, to stop them from doing something that's going to ultimately, may ultimately prove harmful? And you have to also understand that they're not going to be open to this. The people who use these loans, a million transactions a year in Utah, is because they need them, and most think they can pay them off. And so going back ultimately to the question, the petty industry knows that person sitting there, when they're 90% sure, 90% of them are sure, they are going to pay that off in two weeks but only 30 or 40 percent do pay it off. The payday lender knows that. They ought to be telling that to the individual and say, oh, maybe they won't take out the loan. Well, I think there's some responsibility there, and I think disclosure laws, uh, Judge Maybe, would be helpful in that regard. Let me ask a question which uh, Professor Peterson submitted, and that is, are high-cost loans immoral? <laughs> and uh, let me ask it in the context of payday loans, but also in the context of credit cards where credit card lenders allow borrowing to continue on the credit card as one's uh, credit worthiness declines, but increase the interest rate charged such that it would exceed 36 percent. Are high-cost loans immoral? Well, um, <clears throat> I'm not... Uh, uh, you know, I'm not sure that I have any deep insight into what's moral and what's not. Obviously, that's a, a very personal consideration, and everybody has to decide for themselves what's moral. Um, but I think as a society, we have historically, you know, our society, the, the United States, has historically in large numbers turned to our, our religious and moral heritage to try and decide uh, whether or not uh, different types of behavior are acceptable or not acceptable. Um, and it seems to me that in our tradition, we've had a long-standing ethic of not taking advantage of the impoverished. And, and, the, and you know, I, I talked about this a little bit in the introduction, but it seems to me that, that the Bible is ironically uh, unequivocal on this point. For example, in Exodus it says, If thou lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, thou shalt not be to him as a user, neither thou shalt thou lay upon him usury. Well, if a 520% interest loan isn't usury, what on earth is? Does that sentence have no meaning for us anymore? Uh, and uh, you know, and it's not just um, uh, it's not just uh, the Old Testament. Uh, uh, you know, the, the one time, as I recall from the Bible, when when uh, uh, Jesus Christ had any uh, sort of action of violence at all, it was when he was uh, 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 expelling the money changers. Uh, he made himself a whip and he he flogged them. Um, well, the money changers were the check cashers of the day, uh, were they not? Um, so, in my view. Uh, and obviously, you know, I, I don't mean to be, you know, I'm not a, an especially religious guy, and I hope that, that I'm worried really that that sounds a little bit preachy, but those are the sort of moral traditions that have been handed down to us. It seems to me like the traditional conservative uh, uh, approach is to consider at least some loans beyond the scope of what's ethical. Uh, uh, and to me, 36% seems like a reasonable limit. More likely than not, uh, uh, society is better off if we constrain uh, the, the marketplace at, at loans above 36%. General Shirtliff. Well, again, 36% is a number that just was pulled out of the air. I don't know. And, and to, to, for government to come in and impose it on and say, you have to be able to provide the service 36%. We pulled it out of the air. I know, well, you didn't. I mean, uh, <laughs> Congress did and, and other states did. So, I mean, it's the number that people focus on. And, uh, and yet, who are we to, to, to say, tell somebody, you know, what, what that's going to be? And if it's more than that, then it's usury or that it's immoral. I didn't want to get into a biblical discussion, but I do remember in the parable of the talents, the Lord getting mad at uh, one of his servants and said, you lazy and wicked servant, you should have put your money in the bank, and when I got back, I would have had my money back with interest. Um, <laughs> what is immoral 
is, is if by loaning people money and putting them in, in, in to lending them credit and getting them debt, if, if the result reduces their welfare, impacts or harms their welfare, it doesn't promote the general welfare as required in the Constitution and the preamble of the Constitution. Um, what's immoral, I ask you, about taking better options Actually, to me, it would be immoral, frankly. I'll say this. It would be immoral to take away from somebody an option, an additional option that allows them to avoid bankruptcy, repossessions, and welfare. That would be immoral, not to give people that opportunity and let them make that choice and opportunity. And once again, the facts are in to show that when it's been taken away, people are harmed by that. And I believe it's the responsibility of government to the contrary to make sure that these opportunities are allowed and that the free market in this case is allowed to work. Uh, as long as the disclosure laws are there, people understand, and there's reasonable limitations. <laughs> Any response? Yeah. Um, well, we take away options all the time. Uh, there are lots of products and services that we don't tolerate in our society. For example, uh, is anybody willing to say that it's immoral to take away the option to use crack cocaine? No. That's, crack cocaine is dangerous. You get addicted to it. It has all sorts of externalities, and it's a bad idea. Uh, we also don't allow a commerce in weapons-grade plutonium because it could allow somebody to build a nuclear bomb. We don't allow uh, commerce in child pornography. And for the vast majority of our history, we did not allow uh, uh, commerce in, in high interest rate loans because they have certain socially destructive characteristics. Furthermore, 36% is not pulled out of the air uh, it, some, you know, randomly. It's a, it's a time-tested uh, uh, cap that, that has existed for a long time. It was the median interest rate cap that most states had adopted in 1965. Um, uh, and, and what's more, it's also the cap that China sort of figured out on their own, independent of us. Uh, there's a lot of testing and a lot of sort of thought that went into that, into our historical, traditional rules. Uh, it's not like it just sort of came out of nowhere. It's, it's a time-tested rule. It is time tested, if I may, to, to show that in those states where it's imposed, then payday lenders are gone. It's over. In fact, in states, other Good. states like Oregon and Washington. <laughs> Let me ask the debaters now to take a step back and look, <laughs> look at this global, at the, at the uh, domestic, the national economy. And I, I'll ask the question this way. Subprime mortgage lending has damaged the nation's economy. There is no question about that. High interest consumer loans and credit card accounts are another form of subprime lending. They are easy credit for the less affluent. Now, in a recession, do defaults on these high interest subprime consumer loans threaten the economy just as defaults on subprime mortgages have. And I would add to this question the fact that uh, about half a trillion dollars of consumer debt has been packaged and sold to millions of investors just the way subprime mortgage loans were packaged and sold. And so as defaults may rise, on these consumer loans, uh, are we threatening our economy as the subprime mortgage uh, lending crisis has? And General Shirtliff, would you go first on this? Well, the answer is no, <laughs> primarily because these loans are unsecured loans. There's no property lost, as you had in the mortgage field. But, but it's a good question, because, um, because it is dealing with debt and with people who, who are to the point where they are, there are so many people who are so much trouble that the federal government then feels they have to step in and with a lot of money bail people out. Um, and going back to subprime, you know, they're the evil of the day. Uh, I'll make this statement. There is nothing inherently evil or immoral or bad about a subprime loan. We're not going to step in and take away the right of, of people who are credit risks or who are less sophisticated who need credit. I mean, that's the problem, I think, and I, and I believe that the rise, this is my own personal belief, I don't have a study to, to show this, but that rise that Professor Peterson showed in the last 10 years, compare it to what has happened in fees and rates and, that, that you have with, all, with your credit cards and, and all, all push to, to you know, give you easy credit and, 
and checks in the mail that you can fill out and get whatever you want. I mean, all that has happened, and, and in the meantime, people have, have, have demanded the demand for these other low-cost and small amounts that people need on a two-week basis or so has grown because they've got, they, they can't deal with that on that end. In, in the subprime, the problem came there in, in the fact that these companies uh, didn't have good standards of practice, good disclosure laws. They weren't watching their thousands of storefronts and thousands of employees who, who were going overboard and manipulating people and convincing them that they could afford these loans and convincing them that they had the income to be able to take care of them and, and meet their mortgages. That's where the problem was. That's where the fraud occurred. That's where the, and, and, and that's why AGs, after we sued Household Finance, we sued AmeriQuest for $300 plus million plus and also required judicial oversight and a manager to come in and make sure that they were changing those disclosure laws and the way they dealt with people. Well, by then it was pretty much too late and we ended up in this big problem. But again, I, I want to make the, the distinction between that and payday lending and the huge distinction is that it is, it is welfare enhancing because it's not putting their property at risk. Uh, and, 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 and so in that regard, I don't think the comparison's that. Professor Peterson. Um, all right. Uh, well, a couple things, three things at least. Um, first, I, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with this question because I'm not an economist. I don't study, you know, macroeconomics. And there's, I mean, there's a real fact of the matter about the sort of exposure that the economy has with respect to these loans. And I'm not sort of the most qualified person to think about it. Um, but second, I do, I have seen some things, things that seem very troubling to me. For example, in the past uh, five, six months, there's been a dramatic increase in the number of people who are paying their utility bills on their credit cards. Uh, a lot of people uh, think that that may be because um, these are people that are uh, uh, sort of facing foreclosure. There's a whole bunch of people out there that are having trouble in the subprime market, and now they're shifting their borrowing, the sort of you know, uh, the, the lifestyles that they can't afford, they're shifting it into their credit cards. My sense is maybe that might have a tendency to just dig the hole deeper, uh, particularly if these credit card debts start getting securitized the, the same way that the mortgages did. So they package this debt uh, uh, and, and pretend that that's going to be good debt, that that's going to be collectible, and then they sell it to investors, hedge funds, mutual funds, pension funds, who believe that they're going to be able to collect that money, but in reality, they're not going to be able to because um, you know, the, the economy is not doing well. These people are on the verge of bankruptcy and they're losing their home. Uh, so I think that there is probably some risk right now. Um, and last, it seems to me that the, the credit card debt above 36%, above the usury limit that we're talking about today, seems like the credit that's most likely to cause those types of problems. Because who is it that's going to borrow money on their credit card when they have to pay 36%? Precisely the people who can't, uh, who are unlikely to be able to pay that back. And what's more, uh, the General, Attorney General Shurtleff suggested that, that uh, they're not going to be able to get to their property. I'm not sure that's so much true since uh, uh, you, know, you can collect unsecured debts by getting a judgment in court and then uh, putting a lien on property and using um, you know, the collection system to try and collect those debts. So you know, it, it's harder to collect on a credit card. Uh, that's certainly true than it is on a mortgage. But uh, just because it's, it's harder to collect, it doesn't mean that there might not be some potential risks out there. I don't really know the answer to the question. May I just respond? Uh, that wasn't a joke. Because I'm what not an economist about? either. <laughs> <laughs> Laugh when I tell jokes, not when I'm serious. You can hurt my feelings. I, I appreciate Professor Peter is not an economist, neither am I. But there, I, I do know an economist. His name's Don Morgan. He works at the Federal Reserve. <laughs> I've heard of him too. <laughs> <laughs> he said this. Um, again, in, in looking at the facts I already told you, I won't repeat those. But. Uh, he said that the increase in bounced checks represents a potentially huge transfer from depositors to the banks and credit unions. By pe banning payday loans in Georgia and North Carolina, it did not save Georgia households $154 million a year, which is what the so-called Center for Responsible Lending said would happen. They said that if you ban payday loans, you'll save Georgian households $154 million a year in Georgia. No, on the contrary, it cost them millions per year more in return check fees and did not save them. But the facts are in, are real and, and, and make sense. And uh, again, welfare, and, and they also showed that these folks who were in trouble to try and stave off bankruptcy, to try and not to lose their home, they would go and sell their assets. They would pawn things and they would sell everything they can. That is not enhancing the welfare of the people. It's not promoting their welfare by requiring them to sell off property. To the contrary. 
Thank you. I've uh, woven in as many questions as I can in the time allotted. I give you now, General Shirtliff, an opportunity to sum up, followed by Professor Peterson. Okay. I'm not going to go back to the PowerPoint because I think I got to most of my, my points, although I had some great pictures I wanted to show you. Again, uh, <laughs> uh, let, me, let me again thank uh, the University of Utah, uh, S.J. Quinney College of Law, Dean Shodosh, for this opportunity. Uh, I, I appreciate the chance to debate uh, the law and the facts and to, to reason. That's what it's all about. Uh, I, uh, I got to tell you, you know, I don't intimidate easily. Uh, I deal with a lot of people, and I, I, I was intimidated when I asked to do this because I, I uh, did my research on this Professor Peterson, and he is, a, he is an expert, and he knows his stuff. And what I really appreciate is the fact that his, his mother, Margaret Peterson, and I were, were once foes years ago in, uh, in running for a county commission seat, and we've been friends ever since. I would hope in this debate that, we, that, you know, there's a lot of things that are thrown out there, a lot of uh, vilifying of people and industries, that we would all educate ourselves as to the facts. Because, you know, I think we're all really concerned about the same thing. And that is helping people who find themselves in need of some assistance, who for whatever reason just can't quite keep their head above water at that point, and they need something. And they don't want to have to go take out more credit cards or pawn things. They want to have an option. Uh, we ought to provide more options to people. That's the free market system I began talking about tonight. Options, opportunities, more, more choice is good for the economy. It's good for consumers. And competition is great. I, I, I do want to, in my closing, let you understand a lot of these arguments you're hearing, and many of the ones that I've heard tonight, uh, are really being presented by a group called, as I said, so-called the Center for Responsible Lending. They testified before Congress. They were leading the charge with the military. They, they brought in the head of the NAACP to testify. And, and really, they're, they're, you have to understand that this organization, the CRL, is fully owned and funded by, guess who? A competitor of payday lending. It's credit, community credit unions, self-help credit union. Same CEO. You even look at their letterhead, it's got the same symbol. So, in effect, what you're doing with, with CRL and people following along and being scared and frightened and, and calling people sharks and evil and, is, that, is that, in the end, all you're doing is taking away an option from people to the benefit of a competitor. And that's just wrong, particularly when the studies are now in to show that it hurts the, it hurts the individual. It hurts and, and, and hampers welfare. I wanted to go back to, in, in, in my final closing, to some of the things that Professor Peterson mentioned in his opening. Um, and, and indicate, this is true, that, that these are people who can least afford the nurses, the grocery clerks, the construction workers. You know who else they are? They're the law students. They're the young warriors, often with little families who, for whatever reason, because of a move or something, find themselves in an emergency situation where they just don't have the money. And we ought to give them every option they can and let them make the choice of what type of loan they want to get. Um, this, uh, I guess what, what I ultimately want to say is my job as Attorney General is to do the people good. I really believe in, uh, in a quote from John Adams, and he quoted Cicero, and Cicero said that the people's good is the highest law. My job is to enforce the law, to establish justice, promote the general welfare, and to make sure we secure the blessings of liberty to everybody. And so it's ultimately the people's good. And if there's a predator out there, if there's somebody who's ripping you off, I think I have a pretty good record in seven years of coming in and, and forcing them to obey the law and to pay you back if they've hurt you. Uh, but I've done a lot of research in this area, and I truly believe in my heart of hearts that, that the people's good is best served by providing competition to buy, allow people choices and opportunities who are in need. We shouldn't take away the right of these people who, who need loans, who can't afford afford the typical loan because they have no credit, because their credit scores are so bad. We ought to give them the opportunities to get by, and that's what this does, and the studies have confirmed that. Uh, there should be certain restrictions, certain limitations, disclosure laws, make sure people know. Let's all get involved in this together, educating the public about the risks involved. And once they're educated, once they understand what they're doing, then let's them, let them have the choice and do everything we can to prevent them from spiraling out of control when Every intent is the moment they take out that loan is to pay it back in two weeks, but something else came up and now I can't do it. And, and ultimately, yeah, it's okay to put those limitations in place, but we've given them the opportunity to f f 
to, to be able to, to survive and to get by. That is what enhances and promotes the general welfare, and I think that's my responsibility. And I, again, I really thank all of you for the opportunity to uh, debate tonight. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Peterson, please. <clears throat> well, I, I'd also like to, to thank Thank General Shirtliff, who I think did a great job, and and I, I was a, I thought I was the intimidated one. So, <laughs> um, uh, uh, I think it's you know it's, it's great of you to come and participate in our event, and uh, and obviously you're one of the college's most distinguished alums, and have and have provided excellent service uh, on behalf of the state of Utah throughout your tenure. You know, honorable, good man. Um, and and I, I have tremendous respect for you. I hope I want you to know that. On the other hand, I completely disagree with you about uh, loans. I, completely um, wrong. That's right. <laughs> on this particular issue, uh, I, I don't agree. But but obviously, I think on, on the vast majority of things, we will. You know, for me, um, uh, you know, my political party affiliation or or any of those things. I mean, all those things are secondary. Before that, I'm an American, and before that, uh, I'm a I'm a I'm a father to my kids. Um, and my guess is on the vast majority of those things, we're going to be lockstep. Um, we're going to be, you know, getting along on everything. Um, so ho hopefully, uh, you know, that's, that shows the respect that I, I feel towards you. Um, but it's a couple of points, I guess, uh, to summarize or to close up. First of all, I, you know, the Center for Responsible Lending, I, I think they're a pretty good outfit. But they don't speak for me, and I'm not taking their stuff uh, unless I agree with it. Um, I sort of make my own opinions. I'm, you know, I'm my own man. They're not. I'm no puppet on a string. So, um, uh, you know, they they may say some things, and I agree with them sometimes, and I may not agree with them other times. And as far as their affiliation with a credit union, I, I don't think that that really tells us anything about whether or not we should limit interest rates uh, to 36 percent per annum. And uh, also, uh, I don't believe that the studies are in indicating that uh, 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 indicating that that uh, banning payday loans will cause financial problems or decrease welfare. In fact, I think there's one study, uh, and it hasn't been published, and it hasn't been subject to peer review. And I don't never heard a response to the argument that um, to the argument that it makes is that bounce checks went up in Georgia because the Atlanta Processing Center had more checks. But Atlanta, being the regional capital that it is, processes checks from states that aren't Georgia, including, for example, Louisiana, which still has payday lending. It still authorizes it and has suffered all sorts of financial trauma, both from uh, the elimination of a lot of the bankruptcy protections, uh, uh, from the subprime mortgage lending fallout, and also from the natural disaster that was Hurricane Katrina. All of those things could be the reason that there was an increase in bounced checks in the Atlanta Processing Center. So in my view, that study doesn't show anything. And you know, so I don't think that the studies are in. In fact, my sense is that most of the studies that are out there indicate that payday loans tend to devolve into debt traps where people have, at least some of the people, the typical borrowers, have great difficulty uh, uh, extricating themselves from uh, the financial situations uh, that are associated with them. And what's more, I think that there are very comparable circumstances in, in the credit card industry as well. And I guess in conclusion, I'll uh, talk about a couple of things that General Shirtleff mentioned in his uh, uh, opening statement. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, the General Shirtleff, uh, as you recall, may uh, opened with Adam Smith. Adam Smith, of course, is the venerated uh, father of modern economics. He's the most respected ec economist in, in, in the history of Western civilization. Uh, and he's the, he's the guy that came up with the notion that the invisible hand, uh, that, that markets work like an invisible hand guiding things to in, uh, an efficient equilibrium outcome. Well, it turns out that Adam Smith believed in interest rate caps. Uh, in in uh, book two, chapter four of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, he wrote that uh, the market for loans for this particular type of product or for this particular type of service could never be expected to perform efficiently so long as what he called prodigals and projectors could be enticed into loans contrary to their own best interest. Uh, and, and, and human nature being what it is, Smith pointed out that uh, user limits, quote, ought always to be somewhat above the lowest market price or the price which is commonplace, uh, commonly paid for the use of money by those uh, who can give the most undoubted security. So even Adam Smith recognized that there were limits to the effectiveness of the invisible hand. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. The invisible hand does not work in the market for um, uh, weapons-grade plutonium, uh, for crack cocaine, and it also doesn't work in the market for 520% interest rate loans. 
Uh, and then also, uh, the, the uh, General Shirtliff uh, pointed to Pope John Paul and his advocacy of capitalist systems. And he had a lot of reason to do that. He grew up in Poland under the Soviet Union and saw the sort of boot of, of communism, uh, you know, the, the hard end of that. And nobody in, in this room, I think, is advocating that we become communists. Certainly, I'm not. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a commercial law professor. I teach business. Um, I believe in capitalism. But uh, the Catholic Church has had a long-standing advocacy for interest rate caps. Uh, in fact, there are priests around the country that are actively campaigning to try and impose just the very type of usury limit that we were talking about now. So holding up Pope John Paul as an example of somebody that wants to have unlimited deregulated interest rates, I think is misleading. Uh, and finally, uh, there was also a mention of, of uh, de Tocqueville, the great French uh, student on uh, American society. And the quote was that, as I recall, was that um, uh, what, we don't want to lose what's great with respect to America because you know it's a great country. We have this sort of community ethic or individualism that balances out well. Um, but you know, to, de Tocqueville was writing in the 19th century. At that time. Every state in the union had interest rate caps that are much more aggressive than the one I've been advocating today. So the great America that de Tocqueville was talking about was an America that had reasonable limits and, and standards for commercial decency in society. Uh, my view is that a 36% interest rate cap would still allow everybody to have plenty of access to loans. There's more than enough leash to get yourself in trouble uh, with a 36% interest rate loan. But uh, we'd be better off without it. Thank you. Our thanks to the debaters and to the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.